good morning. Wonderful to see you in the Lord's house today. This uh, Sunday after Easter, really, it's uh, the second Sunday of Easter in the church calendar. And uh, we'll have, there's really about, I think, six Sundays of Easter before we move into the season of Pentecost. But for uh, years and years, uh, church tradition has called the Sunday after Easter Low Sunday. And so it must have been even before spring break and uh, even before people went on those vacations during this time. It seemed, I guess there is, you, you build up to that great celebration on Easter and it's not like the air can't be sustained in the balloon, but it goes down a little bit. But uh, as we're together today and singing and praising and worshiping, we all can sense and see we're glad we're in the Lord's house today. And uh, it is worth being here to, uh, to worship our Lord and our Savior. And uh, that is what I want to talk to you a little bit about <clears throat> this Sunday and next Sunday. is just a couple of Sundays on uh, worship and what worship is about from a biblical perspective and why we worship or what attitude is God looking for when we come to worship? What does he want from us as we come to our this church on Sunday mornings or small groups or Wednesday or any time we're together to worship the Lord? Uh, as Alan mentioned, as you've been reading, and we, I just want to say it a few times so we get it, ingrained in us that two weeks from this Sunday, May 12th, on um, Mother's Day, we will go to two services, and we'll have an 8.30 and we'll have an 11. 8.30 is going to remain <clears throat> like it is, very traditional. 11 o'clock is, is going to be a more of a mix. It's going to be uh, using our praise band. We'll talk more about that uh, next week. Uh, going to be using um, our hymns, our great hymns of faith, our great new praise songs, our choir, and all the other gifts that we can bring. I'm looking forward to that as we worship uh, with more of the body of Christ at one time. Uh, but to look at worship this, uh, this first week of this worship series, uh, we want to see where Jesus said, that there will come a day, and we're in that day, where we will worship or should worship in spirit and in truth. So if you have your Bibles with you today, turn with me to the Gospel of John, or plug it into your smartphone, the chapter 4. This is uh, in the midst of the story of Jesus talking with a Samaritan woman as he uh, goes into the land of Samaria, and uh, he meets this woman at a well, and they begin to have a conversation. And we will pick up this narrative, this conversation between the woman and Jesus with verse 19. Sir, the woman said, I can see that you are a prophet. Our ancestors worshipped on this mountain, but you Jews claim that the place where we must worship is in Jerusalem. Woman, Jesus replied, Believe me, a time is coming when you will worship the Father neither on this mountain nor in Jerusalem. You Samaritans worship what you do not know. We worship what we do know, for salvation is from the Jews. Yet a time is coming, and now has come, when the true worshipers will worship the Father in the Spirit and in truth. For they are the kind of worshipers the Father seeks. God is Spirit, and his worshipers must worship in the Spirit and in truth. The woman said, I know that Messiah, called Christ, is coming. When he comes, he will explain everything to us. Then Jesus declared, I, the one speaking to you, I am he. The word of the Lord this morning. Well, it's amazing to, um, 
to realize first that even before Jesus, even as Jesus is talking to this woman, even for hundreds of years preceding that, there had been worship wars going on. Isn't that amazing? It had been going on uh, even before Christ for a long, long time. And as Jesus is meeting with this woman, what he's previously said to her in talking uh, about living water and, and also talking about he knew this woman's character, he knew this woman's history. And he had just said, you know, when he said, go get your husband, and, and she said, well, I don't have a husband. And he said, no, you're right, but you've had, I think it was five husbands before now. And so he's kind of getting personal. And so as many of us do, uh, this woman, this Samaritan woman, really tries to change the subject. She tries to change the topic. And she says, well, um, yeah, she's probably thinking, yeah, that must be true. How do I get out of this? And so she says, you know, uh, we Samaritans worship on this mountain. You, uh, you Jews worship in Jerusalem. She says, maybe I'll, I'll get a, a conversation going on religion, and I'll defer, I'll distract Jesus from what he really wants to talk about. And that was the worship war of Jesus' day with the Samaritans, is that the Samaritans said, the only place that you can truly worship God, where God's presence truly resides, is on this other mountain. I believe it's called Kazir. And the, the Jews had said for, for centuries, no, uh, the only place that true worship can take place, the only place where, where God's presence really resides here on earth is in Jerusalem, and specifically in the temple of Jerusalem. And so that disagreement had caused this enmity. That disagreement had caused these two groups of people who believed in one God to not even want to talk to each other for hundreds and hundreds of years. Isn't that amazing how small little things that don't matter can divide us and separate us and become a huge mountain, no pun intended? But Jesus' response to this is he brings it back to the eternal. He said, the time is coming when you will worship the Father neither on this mountain nor in Jerusalem. And what Jesus first says about worship is that the time, the place, or the day of worship does not matter when it truly comes to truly, honestly, deeply worshiping God. It's not where we are, it's not what day it is, it's not how many we have, but it's something else. Where we worship, the order of worship in our bulletins, it's a, it's a church preference. You could take, don't do this, but you could take a month of Sundays and visit all around different churches and you'll discover different orders of worship. You'll discover different styles. You'll discover different traditions. You'll discover different ways of worshiping. Uh, the styles of sacred music, the types of prayers, the way we dress, these things, Jesus says, are not central to true worshiping ha happening. Christ has come to free us from these strings-attached requirements. And one way is, is even in the basic belief of the Samaritans and Jews. Jesus had said before, the kingdom of God is now at hand. And one thing that that meant is that Jesus came to teach what they had forgotten is that God is not only found just in a temple in Jerusalem or up on the mountain where the Samaritans thought, but the kingdom of God with Jesus coming means it's going to come and the kingdom of heaven is coming down to meet the earth and intersect that God is everywhere. Heaven is everywhere that God is. Heaven is everywhere Jesus is. 
and worship is going to take place within us and in our heart. So Christ would say we can worship God anywhere we are, in our home, in the car, going to work or to an appointment, at school, in Sunday school class, in a small group, in the sanctuary. But we should worship God at any time, not just Sundays at 9.30 or 8.30 or 11. Every day of the week, our lives, our thoughts, our words, our meditations should be of worship to God. Worship is all of the time. Christ tells us he's going to be available when his kingdom comes in to be to every person. It's not going to depend on uh, what sex we are, what nationality we are, what denomination we are. There are no longer any barriers since Christ died on the cross and was resurrected for our sin. Worship is for everyone, and God is looking for everyone to lift up worship unto him. What are some of the things that means for us? Well, church growth experts in our culture have been saying even since the early 90s and mid-90s, and boy, it's coming to bear now, that if congregations now are going to reach people for Christ, if we're going to uh, welcome uh, people, make people feel welcome to come in and offer their worship up to the Lord, that we are probably going to have to do a few different things. That's just the reality of the times that we live in. Someone said that sometimes you have to kill a few sacred cows to get something moving in the Lord's church again. And so you're going to see churches all over change their times of worship, change their style, change the place. It, um, it, may make, it may be changes that some of the things that we've grown up comfortable with over the last 50 years are just not going to um, attract the culture that we live in now. That's just the fact of reaching people for Christ. And Jesus tells the Samaritan woman that change will be necessary for her and her generation. And one day soon, she'll find out after the resurrection, if she remembers and believes in Jesus Christ, that um, she'll realize that I don't have to go up to a mountain to worship. But worship's going to be very different because I can worship the living Lord Jesus Christ. So how does Jesus explain this a little further? Well, he says that worship is going to be done. What it's going to look like in this new kingdom of God is that we're going to worship in the spirit and we're going to worship in truth. That's what he's looking for. So first of all, worship is in the spirit. Now, worshiping in the spirit, I think, means that we're going to learn and need to depend on the Holy Spirit in us to guide us and energize us and motivate us to worship our great God and the Lord Jesus Christ. The Holy Spirit gives us the urge to come here on this Sunday morning to lift up and praise the Lord Jesus Christ. And whatever the elements of worship that appear in our bulletin, if the Holy Spirit is not there as we act those out, as we give up our worship, if we're not worshiping in the spirit of the living God, no matter what our bulletin looks like, we're not offering true worship to God, are we? It's our attitude. It's what we come here for. It's us wanting to give to God. It is us pouring out true worship. is us pouring out our love to Almighty God. It's an affair of the heart. It's a inward reverence of us bowing down to the holiness of God. It's realizing that, that God is God and we are not. That's what worship is about. Worship's all about God and, and for the moments we're in corporate worship, it's nothing about us. 
unless it's God speaking to us and him asking us for a response to his word. And this reverence and respect should be considered whenever we worship. Worshiping God in the spirit means it means that we, we develop our spiritual senses. You know, we, we know we cannot see God right now with our physical eyes. We don't hear him with our physical ears. But when we worship, our spiritual eyes and our spiritual ears can be developed to where we're able to be aware of God, to see God, and we can hear what God wants us to do with our lives. That's why Jesus would often say, "He, those with ears, let them hear. It's only through true worship that that can happen. And these spiritual senses, like our physical senses, they're, they're developed through use. The more we come and worship, the more we are attuned to the Spirit of God, the more God becomes real the more that we sense that maybe some of these thoughts we're having are not just our thoughts, they're God thoughts. And God is putting those thoughts into our mind. And what we're sensing uh, with our emotions or God is giving us those, it's not because of just a style of worship or music that we like. See, true worship is when the invisible part of man you know, that what is within us, our soul, the Bible says, that invisible part of man and women meets with God. We meet and come together and we meet with the immortal and the invisible God. And when our spirit comes together with God's spirit, we worship in spirit. That's what God is looking for. Jesus says not only that, but remember that true worship is done in truth. It, it's an affair of the heart, yes. It's an affair of the spirit, but it's also an affair of the mind. He says that as well as, as worship be in this affair of the heart, that all worship must point with integrity towards Jesus Christ because it's Jesus Christ who is the truth. It's not enough to just have the spirit of worship. It is more than just being pumped up with our emotions and having a, a natural high when we come to worship. But true worship is guided by the spirit. It directs us towards the truth and the gospel of Jesus. If we leave worship and we, we haven't been moved by what Jesus Christ did for us on the cross and in the resurrection, and we don't reaffirm that in our minds, worship has not occurred. It seems today that, um, I guess culture says that we can, there's all kinds of spiritual moments of worship, and they can get us to the same level that are not even Christian worship. The Hindu before his idol can experience worship. The Buddhist with his prayer wheel, transcendental, transcendental meditation, the naturalist that sees God in nature, or just the power of human love. That's where we see God. Now, we may recognize that those that do this are really trying to reach out to some kind of how, higher power, but Jesus would say that worshiping in the truth is not happening. Because worship is not just our, in our imaginations. It's just not us groping high into the air for that which is unseen, trying to put a label on it. But worship is the love we show and pour out to Jesus Christ, who saved us from our sins and gives us eternal life. Worship, in truth, focuses on Jesus, doesn't it? It focuses on the gospel. That's the truth of worship. We worship a God who's been re revealed to us in the reality of Jesus. Jesus says, he who has seen me has seen the Father. And when we realize this, 
we can worship in truth. And until we do realize who Jesus is and we turn our lives completely over to him, we really haven't worshiped. Worship needs to bring us every time we come together into the reality of the resurrected Lord. We need to have that same marvelous, awe-filled wonder of feeling that we have on Easter morning. Or remembering that Easter story now as it goes on, all of those post-resurrection appearances of Jesus. How, you know, those disciples or Mary or those two on the road to Emmaus were just in wonder and awe when Jesus came into their presence. Oh, and they called him Lord and they bowed down and they worshipped him because they were so amazed at what had just happened. True worship is not to lose the awe of the resurrection, that Jesus has come back to life again. We need to know that we worship Jesus who continues to knock on the doors of our hearts and speak to us every time we get together. I was uh, reading this week about the story, the hymn stories. Have you ever gone to look up how certain hymns were written? I, you know, if you have a favorite hymn, do that. Probably even some of our, our worship songs, have, you know, new songs have great stories. I was reading about Joyful, Joyful, We Adore Thee. You know that song. You probably start singing it in your minds right now. Some of y'all could sing it out loud. Some of y'all don't want you to. I'm just kidding. <laughs> but uh, it was written by a man called Henry Van Dyke. Um, and he wrote this in the early 20th century, probably around 1910. And a lot of things were really going on in the world then that were puzzling to believers and Christians. And one of those was the, the main theology of that time was what we call liberal theology. And, and what, what uh, liberal theology said was is that mankind, men and women, were progressively getting better. We were progressively getting more moral. We were progressively getting closer to God. And we were progressively getting more into the, the people of the, the world that Jesus wants us to be. And, um, but also during this time, there were some things in our world going on that was really hurting that theology. One of them is we were on the brink of the First World War. And we had people that... Uh, we're beginning to do very uh, unkind things to one another, very cruel things to one another. In fact, that theology held on even up until Second World War, and then after the First World War and the Holocaust of the Second World War, that theology didn't hold much water anymore. So Henry Van Dyke, is, he, he tried to come up with the words of a hymn that would, would say that, that mankind could be better, that even in the midst of these dark, clouded days, that God was still on his throne, that, that God uh, was still there and we could trust in him. And so he wrote these words of joyful, joyful, we adore thee. And he said it to, to one of Beethoven's tunes, and it's a lively hymn. It's a lovely hymn. It's a hymn filled with hope and promise, and we sing it and we smile in our hearts. And when it came out, it was a controversial hymn. Isn't that amazing? Uh, when it came out, you could probably say it was a new praise song. <clears throat> you know, it was uh, a little too lively for some. It had too much of a beat for some. In fact, for a while, it was left out of standard hymn books altogether because it wasn't slow enough, it wasn't serious enough, it wasn't dire enough. Later in the mid-20th century, uh, they, put it, they put it back into the hymn book. The hymn is said to portray the joy of God's created world and the spirit that resides in the life of every believer. 
It directs us towards worship in the spirit and truth. But isn't it amazing that we almost don't have this great hymn today, which many of us consider a sacred hymn, a traditional hymn, a hymn that everybody should sing. Because when it first came out, it was uh, considered uh, a, little, a little too edgy, a little too edgy for corporate worship. You see, the validity of worship is not found in a traditional or modern place. The validity of worship is not found in a particular style or a particular music genre. The validity of worship, Jesus says, is, in, is discovered when we encounter a transcending spiritual power, the Lord God, that's found and made real in the person, the death, and the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Worship is what we bring. And next time we're together, we'll talk about what we're going to be bringing from the Psalms. Uh, but just know that, <clears throat> that if we, whatever we do, whatever services we have, if we are worshiping in the Spirit, and we're worshiping in the truth. That's where we want to be. And God will honor that. And you'll be moved by that because the Spirit will honor that and teach you and move you and give you the command and obedience that Christ wants you to, to experience and to follow through with on that time of worship. Well, we're going to have a prayer in just a minute. And um, we're going to sing a final song of worship our praise team and I, I just uh, encourage you as we sing to, to do that to, to if, you, if you really haven't heard of that or you've forgotten about worshiping in spirit and truth just as you worship pray and say God teach me or help me to remember or help me to once again come with this attitude come with this desire to worship you every week in spirit and in truth and God will hear that prayer he'll honor that prayer and God will teach you much more than any man or woman can teach us God will teach you how to worship him in spirit and truth so let's pray and then let's worship Lord God thank you for your word Jesus thank you for uh, giving us a uh, something that, that we can just um see and feel and touch and, and, and learn from your word that we need to worship you in the spirit and in truth. Teach us what that means. Help us to grow in that every week. And let us see, leave this place refreshed and knowing that we've given all of our heart to you. For you deserve it, Lord. You have given us the eternal. In your name we pray. Amen.